third in the series, picture this. Uh, and today we will be examining uh, in depth uh, the Night Watch by Rembrandt van Rijn. Now, uh, last week uh, we were looking at Veronese, the marriage at Cana, and talking about how the way in which the painting had been taken from its original uh, setting and displayed at the Louvre had meant that uh, it was interpreted differently, that it lost a lot of its significance, uh, and in many ways had uh, become a painting with a rather trivialized uh, and appreciated for its richness of tone rather than for its message, which was um, extremely important when it was originally commissioned. And today we're going to be doing the same thing with um, this particular painting, um, which we will see not only was removed from its original um, position uh, on two occasions, but um, indeed it was changed in size and also changed its title. Nowadays, when you see the Night Watch, or what is now known as the Night Watch, um, you process down the uh, main, I think it's called the Gallery of Honour in the Rijksmuseum, almost as though you're processing down a Gothic church. Um, you go down and as you approach this, the, the Night Watch, which is a huge painting in itself, becomes bigger and bigger. And you almost have the impression that you are um, approaching uh, an altar. And indeed, this painting um, has come to sort of signify um, the soul um, of the Dutch, uh, of the Dutch idea of themselves. And indeed, when visiting uh, dignitaries come to uh, Amsterdam, they have themselves photographed uh, in front uh, of the Night Watch, very much the way Hitler, for example, had himself photographed in front of the Eiffel Tower. So in other words, this painting um, has taken on a, hu a huge new life uh, of its own. Now, it was originally, um, in, intended um, as a painting of a group of militiamen um, gathering uh, for a celebration. Uh, and the painting was commissioned by this group uh, as a portrait group, uh, and it was to hang in the Dolan or the headquarters of this militia group. I'm showing you this particular angle um, of what is now the Hotel Doylen, which was built later on exactly the same spot, because our hotel that we stayed at, a lot of you have been with me in the Netherlands, was really just um, over here. And in fact, we actually, um, there's, a, there's a, um, a cafe that we all went to on the first day in Amsterdam. Now, the Doylen actually is the name for a rifle range or a practice range. And so this is the spot where um, these uh, musketeers uh, or arquebus people used to actually come and practice. So in other words, it started out um, as um, to commemorate a particular group um, of uh, uh, musketeers uh, who were under the uh, command of Captain Franz Banning Koch. And this is where originally this painting was supposed to be. Now, I want to very briefly um, look at the sort of biography of the painting itself uh, before we look at the uh, ideas behind it and uh, who it portrays and look at the artist himself. So very briefly then, um, this painting, which has now changed position, which has changed uh, significance and changed title and changed size, was originally one of many um, portraits uh, which would have hung on the walls uh, of the, uh, the Doylen or the Musketeers uh, militia group uh, headquarters. However, um, this became sort of fell out of, of fashion not very long after um, it was commissioned. It was commissioned in 1642 um, at the height of Rembrandt's uh, you know, career really in many ways. 
But by 1715, um, it was decided that they would do something else with the structure of the Goylen. And the group vote um, portraits, in particular Rembrandt's, was transferred to the town hall, which is in the Dam Square. And um, when it was transferred to the Dam Square, um, it was seen as being too big. They wanted to actually put it between two doorways and it didn't fit. So what did they do? But they just lopped a bit off. So they locked up the top um, a little bit on the side, but a significant slice um, was taken off on what is our left-hand side. Uh, these pieces were removed and have been lost uh, because by this stage, uh, it wasn't really considered um, as important a portrait, of course, as it is now. Now, um, at the time, it was sort of seen that because it was such a revolutionary portrait, I mean, it was just, you know, a portrait of militiamen. It didn't have that icon status that it now holds. Uh, and um, all of this part then was removed. And it meant that um, the, the way in which we see the painting nowadays um, is changed. Now, in 1885, um, Pierre Coopers was commissioned to uh, design what is now the Rijksmuseum, uh, which was to hold uh, the masterpieces of Dutch art, in particular the Dutch Golden Age. And he designed a whole wing of the museum around this particular painting, this particular truncated painting. And uh, he was very much influenced by Violet Le Duc. Uh, I think we've spoken about him in the past. This is the architect who was responsible for the neo-Gothic uh, designs in Paris, particularly the reconstructions of, of Notre Dame and so on. So what you have with uh, Cooper's uh, design for the Reichs is a neo-Gothic re re Renaissance style building, uh, which is built to have at its center this um, particular painting, which has now become, has lost its original title, which was the uh, group, militia group of Captain Franz Benningcock and has become the Night Watch. Now, why has it changed the title? Well, it's because it has, the way in which it's been treated, um, cut and uh, placed in light, it has actually, the varnishes have become extremely dark. And people looking at it uh, in 1885 had sort of thought, well, it, it must be um, a group going out in, in the evening um, to secure the city walls. And so it was called the Night Watch. In actual fact, it, it wasn't. It was uh, a group that was celebrating uh, the arrival in um, Amsterdam of uh, Marie de Medici. And Rembrandt, as we will see, always has a very, very dark background. So uh, with the deterioration of the varnishes and then of the pigments as well, um, this new interpretation of what it was, uh, was placed in the, the sort of central, almost altar-like position in the Rijksmuseum. Now, uh, the story is that uh, because it was such an unusual type of group painting, uh, the kind of group paintings that you had in the past were, as we'll see, we're going to study this in a moment, um, people lined up um, paying for their portraits and each person would have paid according to the prominence that they had in the portrait. Um, we know that uh, Rembrandt made quite a lot of money from this. He was given at least 100 guilders for each of the portraits and quite possibly a lot more for the two people whom you have in front here, which is Franz Banning Koch and uh, Wilhelm uh, van Reutenberg, excuse my pronunciation. Um, however, the sort of the urban myth is that people were upset, you know, that they didn't feel that, you know, when they took their grandchildren to have a look at this and say that was grandpa, uh, it, they wouldn't be likenesses as and in a dignified enough position as they would have expected uh, with the traditional group portrait. Um, this, however, really seems, uh, in fact, it is false. Um, uh, Rembrandt 
continued to get a huge number of commissions for portraits uh, on the basis of the Night Watch. And in fact, the main character here, uh, Banning Cop, was so pleased with it that he actually had Gerrit Ludens actually paint a small or copy it in a small version. And this was amazing because it means that we now, in fact, we do have a vision of what the original painting was like. And as you can see, it means that the uh, two main uh, protagonists aren't in the centre of the painting, but they're very much on the side and the diagonal nature of them coming out um, of the painting into our space is much more accentuated. But what it has meant is that if you are lucky enough to be in Amsterdam at the moment, which none of us are, um, you would see in the position of the, of the night watch what it originally would have looked like. Although it has never been in the Reichs in that situation, it is now being put up like this. And what has happened with artificial intelligence, they have scanned the copy to um, make to take into account the kind of brush strokes uh, that Rembrandt would have used, the pigments that he would have used. And they've also taken into account the fact that when he made the copy, he, I think, was sitting on a slightly different angle. So all of this, this amazing kind of technology that you have now with artificial intelligence means that they have been able to recreate um, a, the correct version of the Night Watch. And so this, I think, will be um, there this, this year. It's not going to remain there for very long because it is not the the parts that have been recreated by the computer aren't painted by Rembrandt and therefore you cannot show an inauthentic um, painting uh, in an art gallery. Now the, um, the Night Watch is now considered so important it has its own guards and we'll see the reason for that but also there is a slit just below it so should anything happen someone can activate um, pulleys and it will slide down um, into the floor. Now, um, what happens to a painting which becomes an icon or becomes a celebrity? Um, it's almost like what happens um, on the internet now. Um, you get trolled. And uh, what happened with the Night Watch is that on several occasions, um, people have vandalised the uh, painting um, sort of taking out their frustrations at their situation in the community or in Amsterdam or in the Dutch Republic, taking it out on um, the painting rather than actually going and assassinating someone else. So in other words, this painting really embodies um, Dutchness more than the royal family does, if, if you know what I mean. So um, in uh, 1911, uh, the painting wasn't as, as protected as it is now. There was an unemployed sailor who came along and uh, slashed the painting. Uh, it was restored uh, it was the kind of uh, technology of the time, but each, each time it, it has led to significant degradations in the uh, uh, quality um, of the the, uh, the canvas. Then, of course, what happens during the war? Well, in the Second World War, it was known that the Nazis were very interested uh, in, in collecting the masterpieces of the world. We all know what happened to the art uh, in, in Paris. Um, uh, Hitler wanted to create a, <clears throat> an extraordinary um, art gallery of in in his uh, his the city that he was building, and so um, the Night Watch is taken out. This is the Reichs part of the Reich Tunnel, and it's taken out first to um, a castle uh, near Maastricht. Then it's taken to the sand dunes and buried in a kind of vault under the sand dunes. But that's not really are safe enough because the Germans are again um, advancing. And so finally it's taken to um, caves um, rolled up um, in a cylinder at St. Petersburg. This is not St. Petersburg in Russia, it's, it's in the Netherlands. 
uh, and it will be there for a number of years um, during the war. It's with great relief that it is recovered, um, you know, bated breath when it's finally um, un, you know, unrolled and doesn't seem to have suffered significant damage. So it's placed back on display. And in 1975, um, an unemployed teacher comes along and inflicts the most significant damage on the painting with um, a knife. Um, he stands in very nicely dressed, calm looking insignificant person, you know, they're always the most dangerous. Um, and then suddenly lunges forward when, when the, one of the guards is looking away and slashes um, the painting. And you can see the slash marks, but they are more significant that, that there were triangles of canvas lying on the ground. Um, he was considered as disturbed, as you can imagine, and was taken to prison where he later committed suicide. Um, it is then um, uh, repaired and a lot of um, restoration work is take, takes place. And then in 1990, another person comes along with and um, takes out of his pocket when everyone else is just standing looking at it, um, um, a bottle with sulfuric acid and sprays the uh, center of the, uh, of the painting. Fortunately, the guards, uh, who were standing on either side react quickly and they had bottles of special water that they um, sprayed on the painting and uh, it was only the varnish uh, which was damaged. So, I mean, I don't think any other painting has, has um, undergone such significant uh, attempts at its, at its life, so as to speak. Um, during the, the restoration of 1975, it was seen that indeed the many of the pigments were um, degrading, uh, probably they had been attacked by moisture um, during the time that it was underground, and so a significant amount of work was done on it. But you can still see now um, how some of the um, elements of the painting really are just ghosts um, of what they would have been um, originally. So this then um, is the what the painting originally looked like uh, and which we will be talking about. Now, I want to just look um, a bit at the society that produced uh, this particular painting. Uh, we need to look at, this is the seven provinces in 1579, which secede from the Habsburg uh, Empire. Now, Charles V was the great uh, Holy Roman Emperor, who was a Habsburg, um, was very concerned with the uh, inroads that the Reformation in the church, uh, or the inroads that the Protestant church was making on Catholicism in the northern provinces um, of the uh, Spanish Netherlands. And uh, originally he tried by diplomatic means, I suppose, to uh, make inroads on this. And by, in doing so, he adopted um, a Protestant stad, uh, uh, not nobleman, but someone who owned a huge stretches of land, who had been bequeathed stretches of land, the Duke of Orange, who was um, a Protestant, but he was brought to the court of Charles V and brought up with Charles V's son, um, Philip II, who will become Philip II of Spain. And the idea was that um, the Duke of Orange would go back to his lands um, and um, quite possibly, but he was brought up as a Roman Catholic at the, at the court of the, um, of the Habsburgs, that he would go back and sort of counter uh, the inroads that the Reformation was making um, in the North. However, this did not work. Um, the Duke of Orange became aware um, of the plans uh, of Philip II. Now, Charles V abdicates and gives over command of the Spanish Netherlands to um, his son, Philip II of Spain, who is the person who is going to um, implement the Inquisition and is much more gung-ho about reclaiming um, the North for the Roman Catholic Church. He sends in the Duke of Alba, the Iron Duke, who leads a campaign of um, burning, death, destruction, torture, uh, uh, burnt earth, 
um, warfare uh, and earns the hatred uh, of all of the Dutch in who will secede, uh, the seven provinces secede as we saw in 1579 and become the um, Dutch Netherlands and the other parts of the Netherlands become the Spanish Netherlands. Now this means um, that uh, several things that um, it means that the Dutch then form these militia groups, which are uh, set up to protect uh, the cities. Now, they're not an armed, greatly armed force, but they would have uh, a certain element of, of protection, and they were often sent from one city to another to help protect uh, the cities um, against the onslaught of the Spanish. Uh, they would eventually, uh, the, it will eventually end up with the uh, civil war, at least the 80 years war, um, which uh, will end um, in the Treaty of Munster in uh, 1648. So the war starts in 1568 and ends in 1648. And this will be the rise of the Dutch Republic. Now, what had happened during this time, there was a truce during this time, it had meant that there was great opposition. There was a sense um, of the people who were combating the Roman Catholic forces and the Spanish forces. There was this huge sense of um, solidarity um, against uh, an invader. Um, but it wasn't just the fact that they were Protestants and they were organised against the invaders. They also had um, a kind of solidarity which had been built up because of their environment. Um, don't forget that all of this part, and particularly um, Amsterdam is a really good example of this, is that it is reclaimed land and land which is constantly having to be pumped with the windmills. And so um, people had to rely on each other. So solidarity and community um, were extremely important. Um, trust and um, hard work, which is also part of the Protestant ethic, was, was very important. You might say, well, you know, Venice was very similar, wasn't it? It was built on reclaimed uh, land from the lagoon. But the difference there is that you actually had um, a monarchical, well, it wasn't a monarchy, but you had a pyramidal system where you had the doge at the top and then the noble families of the Golden Book, um, aristocrats beneath, and then um, the sort of middle class merchants, I suppose, beneath. So this was this pyramidal structure, which didn't um, apply in the Dutch Republic. There was much more this sense of um, equality uh, that works right from the beginning. The other sense was that the, these people were Protestants. And uh, we will look at later this idea of um, individuality, of examination of one's own conscience. Um, you did not have to go through a hierarchy um, to reach uh, God, whereas, of course, in the Roman Catholic Church of the time, there is the, you know, again, it's a pyramidal structure, you have the Pope, and then you have the Cardinals, and then you have the priests, and then you have these people who actually um, are praying, but have to go through these um, steps, I suppose, to um, reach uh, some kind of uh, spirituality. And this, of course, was, again, a flattened curve for the Protestants. So this meant that uh, people um, of everyday uh, political, religious and social standing um, could rise or fall. So in other words, you weren't, your destiny was not um, predicted by how or where you were born, it was something that you could create for yourself. So you have this sense of becoming uh, rather than actually just being, um, as you have in other monarchies in, in England, for example, um, where the class structure even today, I suppose, is, is still very Im important. So the Dutch in many ways were free of this. And so you have uh, by the end of the golden age, or at least not the end of the golden age, but the end of the 80 years war, um, you have a community uh, working together, pulling together, 
innovative ideas, uh, interest in science, uh, interest in the new world. And so you're going to have this great trading companies, the Dutch East India Company, the West India Company, the first stock exchange, the first lenses, um, many, many inventions uh, based on the importance of the here and now and not placing your um, main interest in the next world, as we had seen uh, with Veronese's painting. So I just wanted to very quickly look at the importance uh, that uh, this rift between the Protestant view of the world and the Roman Catholic view of the world at the time um, was visualised actually in this particular painting. Now, we saw this in the Reichs, and I think it's, it's beautifully um, encapsulated. So it is, of course, painted during one of the uh, truces in the 80-year war. Uh, and you have this sort of really the triumph, I suppose, um, of Protestantism, but it's not particularly um, outrageously triumphant. Um, it's taken from this idea of, of Jesus as the fisherman. Remember, he actually recruits uh, his first two apostles, Andrew and Peter, on the lake uh, in Galilee, so he, who were fishermen. So this has taken up uh, the idea of fishing for souls. And on the left-hand side, of course, you have, there's a rainbow. In other words, it's, there's a truce. But the sun is shining on the side of the Protestants over here. So this is the Protestants on this side of the Catholics. And these are actually orange trees, so it's shining on the group of important people here who is the House of Orange, who um, will be descended from um, the Duke of Orange and the stadtholders um, or the most important um, rulers um, and the next couple of generations will be descendants um, of the Duke of Orange. Now, on this side, then you have all these people who are very much equal. They're all standing equal. They've got the sober dress that we'll look at later of the black and the and the, the white of the, of the Calvinist and other um, uh, Protestant movements. Um, and over here we have um, the Protestants who are picking up souls. Now, we'll just look at this in greater detail. Um, they are um, showing they're actually being relatively successful um, in picking up, up souls. We've even got a convert here who's a monk. And they are showing these books, which are, of course, the scriptures. And this is the basis um, of, the, of Protestantism, which were the three sola. That's sola um, scriptura, only by uh, the scriptures. Sola fede, only by faith. Sola gratia Dio, only by the grace of God. So in other words, you everyone has access to the sacred text, which wasn't the case for the, for the Catholics. It was interpreted by um, the hierarchy um, of the church. Um, and uh, it is up to everybody to... Uh, work out their own individual salvation you know it's it, everything is up to you uh, which of course translates very much into um, a protestant work ethic and also the idea of you can really do anything so here we have the uh the, the Bible, and these people are, are preaching, they're talking, they're using the spoken word, um, and you've got faith, hope, and charity here on the nets that they are using to help these souls. Now, if we look at what's happening over with the Catholics, it's, it's not as good. Um, they've got this idea of they're trying, they're not using the scriptures, they're trying to um, beguile people with music, uh, we've got people singing, we've got incense, we've got uh, baby Jesuses, we've got relics of the saints, you know, lights and, and all the rest of it. The hierarchy here, they're all different, whereas in the other boat, everyone was the same. Uh, and in fact, the boat's falling over because they're all these abbots and so on are so fat um, that they're going to really go in with the people. And in fact, one of, one of these people has even lost his hat. In the original version, um, they, they weren't getting any souls, but um, uh, they relented and put some in. And on the other um, 
uh, other side, I'll just go back, um, you actually had over here, um, rather than equality, you have actually the processions of the Catholic Church with the Pope leading, and in fact, he's been carried along, uh, and you have the uh, Queen, at, at least the Regent, um, Roman Catholic Regent um, of Amsterdam here. Now, this means that uh, what happens is then that you actually have the development um, of a very wealthy, uh, more or less egalitarian society, um, more egalitarian than elsewhere, um, where individual households and, in, and individuals felt that they had the right to um, the goods of this world. But it was a, a bit of a balancing act because on the one hand, you have this idea that you should not be taken in, you know, the austerity of, of Calvinism, the austerity of Protestantism. You know, you don't have um, idols, you, you don't worship statues and so on. So they have to actually invent a new type of art which will um, be acceptable. Uh, and also a new type of art which celebrates the reach of the Dutch East Indies, the reach of the Dutch society, which will bring in um, exotic goods, um, but uh, and also the, the, the right of individuals to decorate their houses. And so you have um, an explosion of paintings. I think there was 1.4 million paintings produced between 1640 and 1660. And during the 1650s or so, there were more painters in um, Delft than there were bakers. So um, painting uh, glorification of, the, of the, this world uh, and was very, very different from what we had seen in the Italian uh, situation. Now, um, the paintings then are very, very different. You don't have sponsors of large canvases now. Um, there are no sponsors such as the, the royal family or the church, you know, who were the people who gave the commissions. You now have um, individual burghers, you know, in people who had earned a bit of money uh, and wanted to show their prosperity uh, and so commissioned much smaller uh, pieces. Now this is a ver very early Vanitas painting and this is very typically Protestant I suppose in the sense that you know there is you know these are objects of the present world but they tell a story. You have to be careful um, of indulging too much um, in the goods of this world even though you have earned them. So you have the skull which reminds you um, that everything will come to an end. You have a rotting fruit. You have a flower which is an enemy which is the first flower to fade uh, of the springtime flowers. You have words which will disappear, the paper will disintegrate and unfortunately the candle's about to go out and the watch um, has been wound down. All right, so in other words, um, death is imminent, um, prepare yourself. Now as um, the prosperity of the Dutch Empire became greater, these still lives. Now, this is what is important about these. That this originally sort of in, in the sort of hierarchy of, of painting types, these were originally at the bottom. You used to have history and mythology at the top, and then you had portraits and landscape, and then at the bottom, still life. Whereas this is sort of more or less inverted with the um, Protestants who, uh, or the Dutch, who now are famous for the uh, depiction of the everyday, not of the exceptional. And um, it's, a, it's a glorification of, of, the, of, of the banal in many ways. But of course, this begins to get a little bit more out of hand as they become wealthier. So here you have what was known as a banquet piece. Um, and banquet pieces were usually sort of not monochromatic, but um, in a very um, gray and pale uh, palette, um, but um, showed both aspects of life. You have the wealth uh, being brought in by the glory, I suppose, of the Dutch 
uh, East Indies, um, and also the wealth of the person who could um, afford to display these elements. So what you have here uh, is gold, uh, silver, pewter, and of course, a glass from Venice. Uh, so all of these sugar also from uh, the, the colonies of the East India Company, the Dutch were feared as colonists, and they tend to play down very much their place in the uh, slave trade as well. However, you also have this mince pie, where is it over here, um, was, you know, it just looks like something that's been left to us, a bit of a mess. Uh, in fact, it was, a, a, you know, showing the wealth of the people who actually could afford this mince pie because it had currants and it had spices that had been brought in from India uh, and Sri Lanka and so on. You also have um, oysters uh, and you have over here a lemon uh, when this was of often sort of displayed very prominently. Uh, this is because lemons were exotic uh, 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 fruits that were brought in. They certainly didn't grow naturally in the climate uh, in the Netherlands. So they were brought up from Spain or from the New World. Um, and were brought were kept in hothouses. So the fact that you had a lemon also meant that you were immensely wealthy. So, okay, wealth, um, depiction of the uh, empire, but also um, depiction of the vanitas. Be careful because this beautiful silver platter has been turned over. It's, there's disorder, um, this glass, beautiful expensive glass is broken, the candle's about to be snuffed out, the uh, lemon has been peeled and is actually falling off, it's all rot. You have a pie that has been left halfway through the unexpectedness of life, you can be snuffed out at any time. Oysters, oyster shells which were known to be aphrodisiacs, perilously close here, empty shells, and in fact, the shells of the oysters have been taken up and not the bread of life, the bread of the Eucharist, which has a knife going through it. And of course, the cloth here, which would have been the altar cloth, you know, that was all that was on the Calvinist um, altar. It's, um, it starts out looking quite good here, but it's a bit of a mess um, over here. So a Vanitas painting, much more subtle, um, very much more celebrating uh, the goods than the other one. And by 1640, you actually have, the, there's still this sense of vanitas, but now you have these, what they call Planck paintings, which um, celebrate um, the goods being brought in. Uh, and there's very little restraint by now, all of these beautiful fruits that wouldn't have been um, being able to be brought in, at least given that uh, in, in Amsterdam, they're all here together at the same time. You've got the crustaceans, which also were very expensive. Uh, you've got the vanitas of the lemon here, but it's much more showing um, the wealth of the person. And also what we would just look as a bowl, this would have been reference to probably um, a Ming bowl, which was being brought in from China. So reference to the empire, uh, the colonies, uh, the trade um, of the East Indies Company, the wealth um, of this person, um, but also this idea that some of these fruits are beginning to rot, be careful. Um, the same type of paintings um, are the you know, the Dutch become famous for, again, it's not the saints, it's not the royal family, it's not mythology, it's what they have before them. Um, are flowers, of course, we won't go into the Dutch and their tulips, which, you know, the tulip mania. Here you have um, a bunch of flowers, none of which would have flowered at the same time. Um, everyone would have known that. It, they look beautiful, they look absolutely extraordinary, interest in the natural world here, but you've got grubs, all right? Notice you've got beetles and grubs coming in. In other words, they're going to rot. And in fact, the uh, flowers are looking pretty rotten here. You've got some that are already drooping. 
The other kind of paintings that were very, very important for the Dutch was the glorification of the household uh, and the of the family itself. So the each uh, male, you know, the husband of the family was the head of the family, but the Dutch women tended to have much more autonomy uh, than they did uh, in the Catholic countries. Uh, and so here we have... Uh, a, a painting of the everyday, you know, with no palaces and nudes reclining on couches and so on. We have domesticity at its height. So here you have the mother um, over here um, shaking out the bed, uh, uh, you know, the, the doona or the, the blankets, and you've got the, the chamber pot here and then you've got this beautiful little girl who's just come in and is um, relating very much to her mother and the Dutch uh, I think there was an English uh, uh, person who came on the early grand tour came over and was astounded at the uh, way in which the Brit the Dutch viewed their children they saw them as as treasures um, something to be uh, cherished in many ways now, the Dutch did not go in for marriages uh, of people of very different ages, um, and they also did not have arranged marriages at the same time. So the uh, bonds between the members of the family were much stronger um, from the point of view of affection uh, rather than status as you had in the other countries. And also there's this sense um, of structure, um, of a whole lot of uh, triangles, rectangles, a rectangle here going through rectangles, squares going out through further squares, squares here. Um, you have a sense um, of harmony, order and peace. Um, the last group that I'm going to look at, uh, the, the, the uh, Dutch sort of pioneered, I suppose, were these extraordinary landscapes. And of course, landscapes, again, was something which were fairly low down the um, pecking order of, of Renaissance style art, and particularly in, in the other parts of Europe. Uh, you will notice that two thirds of the painting is taken up by the sky, uh, and even the part of the other third is taken up by water. This is because of of course, of the canals fighting against the rising tides, uh, and also the importance of, of looking out for storms which might uh, inundate the landscape. And the land was saved or by or reclaimed by these massive windmills, uh, which pump the water out. This is where people had to coordinate, had to rely on each other to make sure that the land did not fall back into the canals. So here you have um, the sort of threatening sky, um, extraordinary, the Dutch became very, very good at depicting different types of clouds, um, just as they were in depicting different kinds of, of fruit and so on in their uh, Vanitas paintings. So here you have, instead of having a person who is the hero, you have the windmill, which is the hero, the great um, vertical, uh, which is going to sort of save this triangular part um, of the land. And so you have the people themselves dwarfed by the hero windmill. I now want to get on to then um, getting back to our paintings um, is uh, the Dutch group paintings. Now, this is the Hotel Doylen that we see and which was uh, built over the original uh, headquarters of the musketeers. And so this was built about the end of the 19th century. Uh, and they put these musketeers up on it um, to, in homage, I suppose, to the uh, its original function and called it the Dolan, which means the shooting range hotel. It's beautiful. I tried to, to get us there for one of our tours, but it was so extraordinarily expensive, I decided since it wasn't the original uh, building of the Night Watch, it wasn't worth the money. So I want to go back then to the very first um, of these paintings. Now, I think we've established that there's this 
Dutch society works in many ways in a horizontal way rather than as a vertical way. And this could not be better uh, visualized than in the Brotherhood paintings. And also this idea of people who are of modest uh, backgrounds um, being able to, by their own effort, um, come to positions of power uh, and prestige uh, in a society. So here we have these very early, this is a pilgrimage, it's not one of the group uh, paintings as, of the militia, as we'll see. And here we have them progressing um, in sort of, well, it is relatively single file, but very much um, individualized as well, um, a warts and all approach to portraiture. You know, there's none of the sort of smooth chiaroscuro that we have. Um, with Titian's uh, paintings, or particularly Veronese's paintings uh, and portraits, um, always with um, a servant. In fact, they didn't exactly see them as servants, but as a kind of administrator. I suppose they'd be an HR person now. Um, and they each have their own little coat of arms, and they're going to Jerusalem. This fellow has been twice, so he's got two palms. And underneath you have who they are uh, and so on. Now, this structure is then taken up for um, one of the first uh, group portraits of guardsmen. And the reason there is white in this is because um, it is but these two pieces on the side um, actually are folded in. And when you actually flatten them out, you have to sort of show that they're not the part of the, exactly the same painting. Now, the guardsmen then, um, usually each city had three different guards group and they had different weapons. Uh, the ones that we're going to look at had arquebuse or muskets. You would have had long bows and um, also the, uh, the other kind of bows. What do they call the short bows? The ones that you wind up. So here you have very much the same sort of structure. You have, they're all men, of course, um, which is, goes without saying, I, I suppose. Um, a certain homogeneity, um, but also already this interest in hands um, as giving movement and articulation to the portrait. And these pieces on the side were a little bit later and you'll just see how they are actually a little bit more individual and not quite so horizontal but they're all very pious holier than now looking nobody smiles as you can see the smile is something that just does not come into uh, usage I mean why would you smile this is a, this is a very serious matter these are men doing their duty you know saving the, their city and so on um, getting out of a henpecked household so um, by 1596 uh, the group portrait and don't forget the one we're looking at is 1642 so you've got about another nearly 50 years you um, I still have this horizontal line, um, very much like the school portrait. Um, people would have paid more, for example, this fellow here um, would have paid more than the fellow over here, for example, you know, you pay, you get what you pay for. Um, he also would have paid quite a bit because he wanted to be shown as the ensign, um, whom we'll talk about later. So he's in a different costume. These two of them are in different costumes, but they really are showing themselves off. You know, this is um, the, these group portraits are sort of not men behaving badly, but men showing their sort of macho image, um, which was denied them uh, from the other kind of, you know, there aren't any war portraits. You don't have these people prancing on horses as you would have had in Spanish art, for example. Now, um, by 1650, this is actually before this, this is Franz Hals, uh, who was the great portraitist um, of Harlem. And quite a few of you will have been with me to um, Harlem, to this wonderful little museum. Uh, which has the um, officers, uh, all of the portraits of the officers of St. George and St. Hadrian. Now, in 1616, in other words, uh, 20 or odd years before um, the Night Watch, you have Hiles trying to shake up the horizontality uh, of the group portrait. Now, why were these portraits 
done every three years the uh, people who were in charge or the officers um, of the Civil Guard of St George uh, would have to be re-elected and but first of all stood down and they would have a, a magnificent banquet which um, this one would have lasted three days but there are actually sort of uh, statutes uh, in the Harlem City Council sort of saying look I don't think a banquet that goes for three weeks is something that Harlem can, should taxpayers should have to pay for so obviously these people you know like their food and by this stage of course in many ways, this had, had this had been a, become a ceremonial group. Uh, 1616, we're in the middle of the truce, uh, truce in the uh, 80 Years' War. These people would have had a symbolic, more symbolic and ceremonial um, approach. Uh, what uh, Hiles has tried to do is to animate this um, and take away the horizontality. So you actually have diagonals, very, very strong diagonals coming in here with the ensigns. Now, the ensigns were these people who are dressed uh, differently, uh, lavishly. Um, an ensign was supposed to be a bachelor. Um, he wasn't uh, supposed to be married. He was young and handsome, um, theoretically, anyhow, according to the ideas of the time. Um, and this was because he was supposed to go into war draped in the banner of the militia to which he belonged and could face death. Therefore, it was better that he didn't actually have a family. So if an ensign married, he lost his position of ensign and would then be up for election as one of the officers. This fellow here quite possibly would have been a former ensign, uh, as you can see by his rather glorious clothing. So these are the ensigns. Um, over here, we have the commander of the group, and then we have the captain here. But this is, um, what's his name? Nicholas van der Mies, who was a brewer and a magistrate. And so um, all of these people here uh, would have been people who were engaged in a trade. You have grocers, uh, uh, brewers, who then, because of their prosperity or their success in commercial businesses, then become magistrates, um, you know, rather than being picked as a magistrate because one had studied and so on. So over here, the only person who's really looking right at us, I suppose, with a quizzical look, um, is the servant uh, who is facilitating the banquet. Um, you also have here then, apart from the diagonals, you have outside, you can, it, the claustrophobia of the, of the guard room is opened by having that view out through the window, which accentuates the importance of the banner. They're all wearing the sashes, which relate to the, 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 in, you know, the colours of, of the St George. Um, you have these hands in groups of two, again, which um, we saw early were part of this animation and part of the physiognomy um, of the um, characters is, is, is accentuated by these, these hands. Here you have a hand which is uh, saluting. In other words, this is, you know, very much the sort of dignity of this man here. This fellow who is a quizzical conversationalist, he's reaching across and making a point. This fellow looks as though he's going to chuck a knife at us uh, and with his other hand, he's actually picking up, he's carving. Um, Van der Mies, whose girth is really quite considerable, he's drunk a bit of his own beer. Um, he's sort of... Uh, in that sort of Titian um, style of having the elbow out, leaning towards us, and we have this solid hand and someone gesturing towards us um, over here. Now, um, a few years later, we have the Civil Guard of St. Hadrian, and um, Hals has modified this yet again um, to make the painting lively, uh, to get away from uh, simple geometry, but he still uses it very effectively by having, again, two diagonals that join in the middle. So you have the ensigns uh, flags coming down towards the middle. So in other words, you have two distinct parts of the painting, which are joined here by the servant who is responding by pouring wine to this fellow over here who, with his upturned glass, is showing that he wants more wine. So these people, um, even though you have them in two distinct groups um, with a 
triangular groups here. They are looking at each other. This fellow responds to the glances here. Um, this fellow is looking in, these people are looking out in that direction. He looks at us, they, they, these people are looking at us. So you have the heads turned in many ways, but um, a very sort of satisfying um, group of, of diagonals. Can you see this? It goes down here, this goes down here, the hands go down here, uh, and so on. So uh, it's a very stable um, construction that at the same time is made to look animated by the fact that the heads are turned, the hands seem to be gesturing, um, but very good physiognomy. So if you actually showed this painting to your grandchildren, they'd be able to recognize who these people were. And this is really what the, the idea of the painting was. These people had commissioned these paintings to sort of show this is how, what a big shot I was in my day, right? It's, you know, it wasn't so much about civic duty um, as um, self-aggrandizement. And of course, it is showing the importance of the feast as well. Now, these people um, are in varying colored sashes. And this, of course, the, the blue and the white and the orange are the, is the flag um, of the Dutch Republic. I think I really like Hulls. Now, Hulls, I just very quickly want to show this, didn't just, in fact, it wasn't just Hulls, but these group portraits were of any of the charitable institutions that um, were inaugurated by the Dutch. Uh, the church no longer looked after the poor or the destitute. It was up to the people themselves. And so uh, here you have the arms house of the old men, you have one for the old women, you have one for orphans. Um, and here, even though everyone's in black, um, the whiteness that is here really makes this quite lively. Um, you actually have two horror horizontal rows here, this fellow, this one here, and then a back row here, and then there's a triangle going up to the old um, servant in the background. Now, people, again, you will notice the importance of three gr groups of three hands here uh, in particular, and the hands are different. Here, this is the hand which is resting on the book um, of money. He's counting out his money. Um, this fellow is a bit of a dandy. He's got his gloves on. He's got this extraordinary sort of trouser leg, which he's sort of showing off in the corner. Um, and this man here, um, originally it was thought that he was drunk and this wasn't the case. He's actually someone who had palsy uh, and uh, he is here seen as a bit of a wreck, I suppose, but very really in a dignified way. Evidently doctors have looked at the hands and shown that he had some kind of palsy. Unfortunately, it's the hat that sort of makes you look at him and think he's a little bit odd rather than anything so much about his face. If you actually look at it, you can see that there are problems with the muscles. Well, after that, um, in 1642, now this is painted at the time of the, uh, um, Oh, I better move on at the time of the uh, uh, night watch. And um, this is by Picanoy, and it's gone back to the same old horizontality. There's, you know, attempt at a group looking a bit more animated. Obviously, these people here um, have paid more and so on. And even after the, the night watch, um, Van der Helst celebration of the Peace of Munster in 1648, you have again this basically horizontal uh, structure, at least with hulls as opening onto Amsterdam behind, or at least possibly it's monster, I'm not sure, behind. Um, people are more animated, but there's still reference to the feast. So in other words, all of these paintings that we've seen of the groups are around eating and sitting down. All right, and this is what is going to be so different with the night watch. Um, I've entitled this from portrait to narrative, right? And so this is the great uh, innovation um, of Rembrandt. So here we have, this is the restored painting with these figures which have been added um, on this side. Now, what we have is a moment in time which has been captured, right? As opposed to an eternal portrait, which is what you have been looking at up until now, a portrait of people totally taken at one time, um, almost like a snapshot frozen in time. 
What Rembrandt has attempted to do is to turn this into a kind of history painting um, where one moment, it, if you looked at this at one moment later, it would be different. So you actually have Banning Cock who opens his mouth. There he is opening his mouth, giving the order to his lieutenant, um, Wilhelm von Rietenberg, who is to give the order for the group to march forward. So we have the order coming here. He stamps on the ground with his um, baton. And this is the, the signal for the group to move forward. The ensign unfolds his flag. Remember the importance of the ensign. The musketeer here loads his musket. The drum rolls and the dog barks. And so we have this moment then moving forward, right? A minute later, different. A minute before, also different. So in other words, you have time, which has been integrated um, into a group portrait. Now, we now have this way in which um, not just the gesture, um, but the foreshortening um, on the hand of Benningcock and the uh, pike, I suppose, of uh, his lieutenant come into our space. So another, instead of actually having people lined up, as we saw even with Hulls, with his movement and everything, we actually had, there was no foreshortening. This is very much um, a reference to sort of Baroque painting, I suppose. This is in the Dutch Golden Age. It is the time of, of Baroque art. Um, the impinging people coming out of the picture plane towards us. And I just actually want to remember, want to emphasize here um, the colors um, of Amsterdam uh, under the Dutch Republic here, the blue, the uh, gold and the white. And I just wanted to show you here, this is a group of people standing in front of the night watch. And the, although the figures aren't life-sized, they seem to be moving into the space of the spectator. You have the impression, and particularly in the restored version, that they are going to come out um, of the canvas into our space. So the viewer actually is integrated into the experience of these um, rather dressed up people performing uh, their civic duty. So, um, the other thing that is very important is in the restored version, how you have these people who have now moved onto one side. They're no longer right in the center of the canvas. And so you get the light streaming in um, from the left-hand side, picking up the ensign, these people here who are moving forward, the little girl, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, Banning Cock, and you can see the um, shadow of Banning Cock's hand um, on Lieutenant uh, Wilhelm's uh, Van Oudenberg's um, outfit. So uh, there's this sense um, of movement forward uh, with the other diagonal of the light coming in from the other way. And it sort of centers on the sort of this area here um, as being the essential part um, of the, the, uh, the canvas. Um, also in the background, I just want to go back to show you, we're looking now at this figure this one here and this one here. So you do have a movement in this direction, but you also have a movement in the other direction. And there's been a number of um, interpretations of this. So one of the interpretations is that um, because it is a, a group painting, which is depicting um, the uh, musketeers uh, and in fact, it is they needed to Rembrandt needed to sort of put forward very much the fact that they were musketeers they were very proud of their own weapons in fact everyone who has a weapon there owns his own weapon uh, which meant that to be um, a member of these uh, militia you actually had to I think to own something like 
property of 600 guilders. So you were relatively uh, wealthy. Uh, you just not, you couldn't just join. You, you, there was um, a monetary exclusion rate. So they're very proud of their weapons. So he, there actually was a, um, a book of showing how to load weapons and these etchings have been used to show that this is really what um, Rembrandt is demonstrating. This is loading the musket. Um, this is called a matchlock musket, by the way, where you actually have um, a, a wick which is constantly burning um, and you have to be very careful. You have to, to load it with the gunpowder and then sort of pull this trigger. Um, this was the, they were called arquebus and they were the forerunner um, of the musket. These were the most wealthy of the people who had the long bow and the crossbow. Um, so there you have this person who is actually shooting um, behind uh, the lieutenant, and then you have the person who is blowing out or cleaning out um, his uh, firing pan, and that is this man here. And um, the fact that Rembrandt actually wanted to emphasise this can be seen in the uh, painting itself, what they call the pentimento, in other words, uh, the shoulder pad of Van Rietenberg had been cut down so that you actually, this would have actually gone over the key part uh, of the mechanism of the musket. And so it, uh, Rembrandt clearly wanted to show the importance of the musket. Um, I've read an interpretation which uh, there are so many art historian you know, interpretations of this. One of them is that um, there is a cross movement. You've got the movement forward over this way, but you've also got a cross movement of the little girl and the person firing the musket here. You can see the, the smoke coming out and the person clearing it here. It seems to be going in the opposite direction. Uh, what does all this mean? Uh, does it mean that uh, Rembrandt was actually just showing that these are people dressed up, that they aren't really particularly serious figures and so on. Now, um, I just wanted to show you, I think the um, importance of this shadow, which comes down here um, onto the glorious clothing of um, Van uh, Rietenberg, who is seen as a bit of a dandy and in many ways upstages um, the captain. But the captain, of course, is in black because he is an alderman. In fact, he would be the mayor of Amsterdam. Now, the protagonist, let's get into this. I'm running a little bit late. We have Franz, Captain Franz Banning Cock, um, who um, is seen here in all his glory. Um, he was also painted in this particular militia painting a little bit later. He um, was a lawyer who'd actually came from a wealthy family. His father was a pharmacist. So in other words, he wasn't a, a merchant uh, who'd studied in I think Poitiers in, in France, had come back and had married into a very wealthy family. In fact, his um, father-in-law had been one of the founders of the Dutch East India Company. And when he dies, um, Banningcock <clears throat> inherits uh, properties, um, one of the most expensive properties on the single, that's the sort of main canal um, of, uh, of um, Amsterdam. Uh, the, the dolphin still is there. It's a luxurious double uh, building, as you can see, and it's sort of like living in that sort of the heart of, of, of Turak and a multi-million dollar building. Um, he also became, uh, inherited all of his uh, the titles, I suppose, uh, and land outside uh, Amsterdam. Wil Wilhelm um, van Rietenberg uh, was a sort of seen here as a bit of a dandy. He uh, really wasn't someone of, of, of great importance, whereas at least uh, Banning Cock not only was the captain of the militia, but he was also um, the mayor of Amsterdam for a time. Rittenberg um, married very well, uh, and uh, through his marriage, uh, found himself uh, with um, a, a title uh, and um, a number of properties outside Amsterdam and then actually tried to sort of uh, get an old lady in the area where he had the titles to say that he you know belonged to a noble family for a long time in other words he was 
um, an up and coming snob, uh, in fact, did absolutely nothing with his life in many ways. And he's only immortalized because of his painting in the night watch. But however, he is beautifully portrayed. I mean, look at all of the tassels and uh, the paraphernalia, all of these sashes, which relate very much to the, the um, colors of the city of Amsterdam. Can you see the um, the blue, white, and orange here, and the pearls, and so on. Uh, here we have it on his legs, his stockings. So um, now let's turn us to the little girl in the painting. Now she seems rather incongruously added, uh, almost a sort of an unreal figure, um, hurrying in the wrong direction, uh, where everybody else uh, seems to be going to the left, she's going to the right. Um, she's variously been interpreted. Uh, first of all, why has she got this? Um, the symbol of the cloven ears, in fact, cloven means claw, I think actually, was the hawk claw. Um, so she has these claws attached to her belt, but why is it a chicken? Um, is, is this a pun on the fact that uh, Hans Banning, Franz Banning Cock's name, of course, relates to um, a fowl or, or a rooster, or does it, is it reference to the fact that they're going to have a great feast? Um, it, is it a sort of a subtle hint of by Rembrandt, he's vaguely sending up Banning Cock? I mean, all of it who will ever know. But she also is seen as the mascot um, of the group. She has um, the drinking horn here, um, which was a very precious object. This was passed around at the feast. Um, Rembrandt's wife Saskia had died the year before, and many people think that this is actually a portrait um, of Saskia, His, her face. Um, would have been, is placed here. She would have been still alive when possibly he was actually originally painting this. So we, I just wanted to point out now the sort of relatively modest, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm really, uh, the relatively modest uh, background. Here we have a fellow who's a grocer, um, however, he's wearing a hat, which um, points him out as being, you know, a bit of a dandy. This is what dandies wore at the time. So Rembrandt uses a lot of different costumes. Here on the right-hand side, you have Sergeant Robert Kemp, who was a Calvinist. And so you um, have him with a different kind of facial hair, different hairdo, and a very um, sober kind of hat. He was a cloths merchant. Um, we're looking at these people here. Now, if you look at the fellow, the ensign, then look at these different helmets. So the ensign here is, uh, a, again, a wealthy merchant, and he has one of these extraordinary hats, and he has the flowing hair of a dandy. Now we're looking at the helmets uh, as sergeants are wearing. Um, Rembrandt was known very much for um, using sort of props. Uh, these would have been helmets of of a former age, but they are very picturesque, as you can see here. Um, it looks also as though this is Rembrandt peering over the back um, of the character here. Now, you can understand why um, these people uh, were, would feel that they really hadn't uh, been given their due uh, for their hundred uh, uh, guilders. And so very, very much later, the, um, there will be in the background, there will be a kind of coat of arms which is put up with the names of the people um, so that at least you can pick out who is who. Now, I just wanted to look at the clothing, in particular, these ruffs. Um, ruffs became very important about 1560, in, and they are sort of when you think of the, this kind of ruff and this kind of outfit, it's very much um, the Dutch Republic. Um, it started out as just being um, a white collar, which not, didn't necessarily join in the middle. Um, women wore it, as did children. Um, it um, gradually became more uh, prominent. Um, in fact, I'll just go back to that. Um, uh, because the Dutch became very uh, successful at uh, bleaching linen. So the linen would be woven um, elsewhere. It would be brought to the um, 
bleaching fields of Harlem and there it would be laid out on the ground and the water um, around Harlem was supposed to be very, very pure. Um, and uh, also there was a lot of milk which was produced. So definitely one of the products of milk is needed to bleach these um, pieces of linen. And this would be exported very much to England where you get what they call Holland uh, cloth. As you can see, something like three quarters of the landscape is clouds. Now, um, the as you can see here, later this um, fairly flat collar um, becomes much more ornate and is goffered. In other words, the, the, the uh, Dutch actually develop um, kind of irons which they use to um, fold the cloth. As you can imagine, because it was white, it had to be taken apart and had to be constantly laundered. Um, so in other words, people who had these very elaborate uh, collars meant that they were wealthy. Um, and I think you didn't go around the streets unloading, um, you know, dung heaps and so on with a white collar like this. So it was um, typical of the Dutch. It was um, a, a line being drawn between um, splendor uh, and expense and yet sobriety. So very much um, in line with the Protestant ethic. And also, of course, um, the white referring to the whiteness of the soul, the transparency of your conscience um, before God, but also the black clothes, um, which also um, related to sobriety. Now, the Dutch also invented um, a form of, of starch, um, and uh, so they became adept in creating these elaborate collars, which, of course, will then be taken over by Elizabeth I of England. Now, we might look at this um, black and sort of think black is black. Um, however, according to Hulls, there were 60 different shades of black, um, and black, of course, showing the equality between everyone. In, in fact, it was a very expensive color to get right and to fix. Uh, and of course, then the fabric could be used to um, differentiate between blacks and partial blacks and so on. And here uh, you now have the rough, which actually also has lace um, around the edges as well. So um, as in those um, still lives that we saw, you know, simplicity and, and messages about the temptations of the, the consumer society, but at the same time pushing those boundaries quite far. Um, one of Rembrandt's wonderful paintings um, is uh, this portrait of, um, sorry, the portrait of the... Um, remonstrant minister um, who was a very old man and Rembrandt actually went to see him to paint his portrait, uh, one of Rembrandt's masterpieces, I, I think. And I, I've used this to show the importance of the collar. So, but you have um, the way in which you have a series of circles, you have the the hands, which is so important in all of Dutch portraiture, going up. So there's a kind of a circle coming up. Then you get the circle um, of the ruff and then the circle of this very modest sort of skull cap until you get round the circles of the eyes, um, penetrating this very, very um, meditative um, approach that this old man has. Um, against a monochromatic background. So it's his head that sort of appears and his glance which penetrates us. Now, the, and when you think of the Protestants, you think of them as all being Calvinists. They weren't. I mean, they were a large number of warring uh, sort of uh, groups. There were the Calvinists, there were the uh, Anabaptists, who will um, eventually become the Amishes in, in America, and the Remonstrants. The Monstrants actually were against this idea of predestination. So, um, but however, the importance of the word of the Bible and the black and the white um, show very much um, a, a Protestant. Um, by the end of the Golden Age, the rough had gone back to being a much simpler form, uh, and there was more emphasis on the cuffs. Um, as being showing one's uh, rank, I suppose, because there's no way you could actually do a good day's work with white cuffs like this. They would constantly have to be washed like your conscience, um, but they also were testimony to great wealth. 
Um, women also, of course, showed great wealth. This is one of Rembrandt's paintings of a very, very wealthy heiress, Van Tripp, um, where you have the absolutely cutting edge collar um, with amazingly uh, emphasized uh, 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 lace uh, showing her wealth. I'll just have to leave her quickly. Now, why was Rembrandt um, chosen? Uh, Rembrandt, of course, was the leading portraitist um, of the golden age. And he, he's known and remembered now um, as one of the gr great self-portraitists um, of the time, but also as someone who is going to develop etching as well. It's not something that is quite as well recognized about his work. And he's also someone who was the master of developing biblical subjects. But um, this scrutiny um, of himself uh, is very much the same as this idea of scrutiny um, of one's conscience, um, the, not the glorification of the mediocre, but the sort of interrogation of the mediocre, um, the importance of the individual uh, and his relation to um, his own inner world. Now, um, Rembrandt was born um, in Leiden and uh, goes from there through connections to come to Amsterdam. And in 1632 um, is given the commission to uh, paint the anatomy lesson of Dr. Tilp. Now, this was a, a coup for him um, because uh, it would uh, set off his um, career as um, a group painter and in particular as a portrait painter. And so after this particular commission, um, he will um, become really very wealthy. But unfortunately, um, as we all know, um, it's a story that doesn't end well. Now, I'm going to be going over a little bit, but I just think it's worth looking at some of these paintings in greater detail. Now, Tulp was um, a doctor uh, who was a very upwardly mobile man, and in fact uses tulp, the idea of tulip, to you know hang out his name. Um, and once a year, very much the way you had with once every three years with the group portraits of the militia, once every year, um, the person who was the leader of the anatomy group would give um, a public audience or a public display of his skill. And this was very typical of the Dutch. They were very interested in the here and now, um, interested, therefore, in science. And so um, deceptions uh, for the medical deceptions were something that people came to witness. And uh, here we have a group of up and coming doctors who um, want themselves portrayed um, as being present um, at this prestigious occasion. Um, the person we have here is someone who would just have been um, executed, um, a criminal. Um, he is laid out very much almost like one of the bodies of Christ. If you actually sort of think of Mantegna's um, Christ uh, on, the, on, the, on the slab, you would recognise this. And even though it is supposed to be a very sort of um, capturing a, a moment in time, um, it wouldn't really have been exactly correct because um, originally all of the guts would have been taken out. He wouldn't have been demonstrating on a full body. So what we have here is Dr. Tulp. Again, the importance of the hands. He's actually um, demonstrating the how the tendons work. He's picking this up um, and demonstrating with his other hand um, exactly how they, they move and how they work. Now, um, these people here, we have this triangle which goes up and down, and inside that you have another triangle and the triangle of Tulp himself. Um, they are leaning forward and they're straining. They're not actually looking at him. None of them are actually looking at him. They're looking at, uh, not even at the demonstration. They're looking at this book here, which would have been Galen's um, book um, of anatomy. And again, this emphasis on the written word, you know, 
it's this is the secular idea of only scripture right so um these people here are looking out at us but he would have been looking at um, a piece of, of paper and these people this one is looking out again over here and i think this one may be looking at dr Tulk himself so um this is where it would have taken place in the varg which was then the weighing station and the demonstration would have taken place up here now, um, out on the back of having been such a successful um, portraitist, uh, he marries his um, agent's uh, cousin, uh, Saskia, who comes from a, a very well-to-do, well, a very, well, not very well-to-do, but a well-to-do family, of, you know, they were mayor of the, of the city that she, she lived in. And... Um, she is often portrayed dressed up in in all of these clothes that um, Rembrandt liked to buy uh, and collect. He was a, a, someone who then spent a fortune um, on collecting objects. Um, and he bought this house on the Waterloo Plain, which is now part of the, uh, in fact, it is the uh, Rembrandt Museum. This, he went massively into debt. People were alarmed at um, the amount of debt that he got himself into. And indeed, he will never actually um, be able to get out of this spiral that he um, created for himself financially. Maybe he made bad investments, but he certainly spent money like water, even though he was a very successful portrait artist of the time. Um, he will use, this is now in the Jewish quarter here, the Sephardic Jewish part, and he will use many of the Jewish people who he was friendly with for his um, portraits. Um, you can see, I just wanted to very quickly reference here one of the portraits that was done about the time of the Night Watch. You can see how successful he is. Here we have um, a Mennonite preacher. This is another one of these um, Protestant groups. Um, again, um, this importance of speaking, uh, reference to the scriptures. Um, here you have the importance of her hands which are reposing, the speaking hand uh, reaching out into space. And this woman is listening with, you know, absolutely absorbed by what her husband is saying, you know, as, as most women um, are. So here we have um, the candle, however, referencing that it, you know, it's still going, there's a lot of it there, but this one, there's none at all reference to it might be going out. So these are his portraits around the time of the night watch. And I just wanted to do, show you one of the ones when, that he painted when he is already actually um, in, you know, starting to be in, in great sort of straits, um, financial straits. Another one of these wonderful group portraits, this is the syndics or the, or the, Grapers, Guild, the Drapers Guild. The Drapers um, had to um, come together uh, three times a week to make sure that the cloth that they were give, being given um, was authentic. And so um, this man here would give, put a little clay attachment to it. Uh, it would be uh, written down in the books here. So what you have are sort of three vertical bands, the band of the table, the band of the heads, and then the band here of the room. Now, it, this looks as though too much emphasis has been given to the cloth, which of course is not just a white cloth now. These people were quite a wealthy guild and therefore they have a Persian or, you know, carpet um, to, to work on. However, it would have been um, placed above um, where they were seated. So in other words, if this was where the syndics met, this painting would have been up there and therefore it needed to be, you needed to have this much of it. So when it's foreshortened, you look up. And this means that this man would be looking right down at us as we walk in. So what um, Rembrandt has done again, rather than just have um, a group of people sitting, um, you have this moment in time when he is actually just getting up as we come in and it's sort of saying well, well who are you I mean they're all looking over there at people who are obviously about to present their cloth but this person here represents more or less us as as we enter and he is acknowledging us and this man here also is looking at us so you get these different the, the glances um, are very different and you get that sort of diagonal so these are the 
the important people here, you know, very, again, you can tell 1660 by the kind of clothes that they, collars that they have. And of course, the servant always at the back with um, bareheaded without um, a, uh, a hat. So um, again, 1665, you have some of his masterpieces that are still being painted. Um, this very, very touching one is called The Jewish Bride. I mean, um, the titles of paintings are only very approximate. Uh, is she, is this indeed her father who is, is giving her a necklace? I mean, it doesn't look like it. He's got his hand on her breast. Uh, he's got his hand round her. They're very sort of united. It's this beautiful. Um, feeling of, of togetherness and tenderness that you get in this meeting of, of the two hands, the gentleness and, and the sort of love and affection that can be seen there. And this is, um, again, with the portraits, this is one of the, the, the great uh, subject matter of, um, of Rembrandt. Now, just what getting towards the end here, um, Rembrandt has now had to sell off most of his, his collection um, of objects. It, it hasn't brought as much money as he expects. And so the house um, goes. He's not allowed to actually be part of the Painters Guild because um, he, he's been in debt. Uh, he has already, Saskia has died. Um, with the, and the three children had already died in, in the early years or early weeks or months of their lives. And their only child which survives is Titus. Um, as she lies dying, uh, Rembrandt brings in someone to help him look after Titus and the, uh, the dying wife. And of course she stays on as his lover. Um, she becomes a bit of a problem because she ends up trying to pawn some of the jewelry that uh, Rembrandt will have given her, the, the jewelry that belonged to his just dead wife. Um, no comment. And uh, because she's done this, uh, uh, Rembrandt gets rid of her and, and has her declared insane. So he then takes on another servant who again becomes uh, his common law wife and will ha he'll have another child um, with, with her. But by now, uh, things are dire. Um, Titus has now died as well. Uh, and he is very much alone. And one of his, his pupils um, has been given the commission to decorate the town hall with the history of the Dutch people, the Batavian tribe, who was supposed to have been so fierce that even the Romans uh, were scared of them. Um, the, this is uh, Claudius Civilis, who was actually um, a warrior who had been brought up in the Roman ranks and so therefore could combat them with some of their own tactics. Now, of course, the Dutch wanted to glorify their past. They wanted a, a hero. And by now, uh, Rembrandt is um, experimenting with a different type of brushstroke, a different type of lighting, um, an um, intense idea of depicting reality. And so he paints an enormous um, canvas with um, Claudius Civilis here taking the oath of these Batavians when they decide that they're going to combat the uh, Romans. And uh, when this is finally uh, given to the town hall, um, they, the aldermen are, are shocked. I mean, that, what have we got? We've got um, a group of thugs, basically, very badly dressed. They're, they don't seem to you know, be dressed in any way. There's no heroic gestures. And not only that, but you've got um, Claudius Civilist, far from being um, a sort of, you know, personable leader, is blind and, and looks like a ruffian with a hat that's, or a crown which is out of place. Uh, the lighting, of course, is extraordinary. This lighting, which already had been used on the figure of uh, Saskia in many ways in the uh, Night Watch. The painting is just taken down and rolled up, uh, some of it cut away and given back to Rembrandt. Um, and so this is the only part which survives of it. Uh, so Rembrandt, of course, then um, dies uh, in uh, sort of uh, in poverty uh, in, and is, is buried in, in one of the churches in Amsterdam. So this then was the night watch that we looked at today. And 
how does it relate then to the other two paintings that we looked at? Well, these people here, like the Dutch, are moving forward into a future. They're moving, they're in a time frame uh, and moving forward. The marriage at Cana, the message here is not to move forward, it's to move away from the present into eternal time. In other words, a step back from present day society, a denial of the present. In actual fact, it's the opposite of the message of the Dutch. And of course, the first one that we looked at, the luncheon of the boating party, has no message really about the eternal life or the glorification of society. It is simply depicting the present moment. And the message is, if there is any, to make the most of the fleeting moment while you can, make the most of your friends and pleasure, because pleasure in itself is worth painting. Thank you very much.